Hi everyone, welcome back to Automotive Manufacturing Solutions Evolution Summit. Uh, I'm Christopher Ludwig, Editor-in-Chief here. Great to be with you uh, once again. As we've been talking throughout this event, uh, and of course across the channels of, of, of AMS, <clears throat> the pace of, of EV ad um, adoption, manufacturing and battery ramp up is increasing. In many cases, in um, we're seeing new suppliers <clears throat> come online. We're seeing a need for new types of tooling, equipment, and of course, um, a push for greater digitalization. <clears throat> we, can, we can debate um, the, the extent to which EV penetration will arrive across North America or Europe. Will it be 30, 40, 50% by 2030? Uh, when will it hit 80%? When will it hit 100%? Um, in fact, that, that variation uh, is in of itself a challenge in manufacturing um, planning. However, what is clear is that the ship has sailed, so to speak, as Joe McCabe uh, from Auto Forecasting Solutions told us uh, told us earlier, uh, <clears throat> electrification is in many ways becoming too big to fail for many manufacturers and indeed governments. So uh, the, 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 the die is cast and uh, manufacturers are, are trying to keep up. In many cases now looking to convert factories from ICE to EV, um, explore the green fields where, where possible, raise capital and set the plans ahead to, to keep up with this. In this session, we have a chance to, to look a bit more in detail at what some of those changes really mean on the factory floor in terms of capital investment, in terms of the automation systems in areas like final assembly and battery system, and indeed the IT infrastructure and backbone needed to support that. Uh, I'll be joining, be joined shortly by a panel of experts with real life experience and uh, oversight of this change, perhaps with a particular view in North America, but with very much a, a global perspective and global relevance. I'd like to introduce our, our panelists before we before we turn to a presentation to start. Um, we, we will first be hearing from uh, a senior industry analyst at the Center for Automotive Research, which is a is a very uh, esteemed and reputable research organization based in in uh, in Michigan, uh, looking across the value chain, and in this case has done some tremendously interesting research on. EV adoption and what that means for manufacturing. We'll be getting some top line insights uh, from some of that today. And uh, the, this 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 speaker is uh, has had focus on materials, lightweighting, powertrain, supply chain, uh, and it is Edgar Fehler, senior industry analyst at CAR. Uh, just want to welcome Edgar onto the screen. Edgar, great to have you with us. And uh, shortly we'll have a, a short presentation from Edgar to give us some some up, some insights into. Uh, forthcoming uh, research, but but what, what some of this change really means. Um, we're also joined by someone who's leading business development at Eckhart, which is an advanced automation supplier. He's working with companies like Ford, Tesla, Honda on production equipment and processes, uh, in, 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 in especially increasingly in electrification and battery. And it's Dan Berseth from Eckhart. Dan, so glad you can be with us here with us today. Great. Excited to be here. Absolutely. And finally, uh, we have with us a senior global solutions architect uh, at, at IT systems provider Inform. Uh, he works across data science, compliance, data and design to build the architectures for automotive manufacturing and supply chain, uh, including with customers like General Motors, Aston Martin, Unipress and more. And it's Ken Royce. Ken, so glad you can be with us as well. So, so there's Ken, you are on mute, but you can stay on mute for a moment. Hey, there you are, Ken. <laughs> so we've got, we, this, these are our expert panel. We're gonna, we're gonna spend most of our time in, in panel discussion, but before we do, we hand it over to Edgar for, uh, for, for some insights on, on what CAR sees happening in this transformation from ICE to BEV, and uh, we'll bring the rest of our panelists in Q and A after. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to you, Edgar. Thanks very much, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to your audience. As you said, I, I mean, I understand you have a global audience. So I, I prepared just a, a, a couple of quick slides. I give you a little bit of perspective on the North American automaker, uh, auto market, the US uh, auto, make, auto market in particular here, just to help uh, level set you. And, uh, and as Chris said, we've got some research that we are uh, going to publish uh, around some of the very questions that we're talking about today, this, this electrification of the industry um, 
and the impact specifically on, on manufacturing for, uh, uh, for automakers. So uh, very quickly, Center for Automotive Research, uh, uh, we are a nonprofit auto industry think tank. We've been doing this for about 30 years uh, here. Uh, we, we have a, a global purview, but uh, a real emphasis here in, in, in North America. Um, to the level set us around, uh, just very quickly around the, uh, 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 how important electric vehicles are here in the market. Year-to-date sales, you can see uh, electrified vehicles, we think about them as being battery electric, uh, plus plug-in hybrids here uh, in, in, in the U.S. are up, um, um, are, are making up about 12% uh, of the market. So top three, very important here in, in, uh, in our market. Uh, but we are very heavily dependent here in the U.S. Uh, on pickup sales and, 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 and crossover utility vehicles. Um, uh, so far, uh, auto sales have been really hampered here, like so many places around, uh, around the world, by the semiconductor shortage, uh, down about 17% year to date. But the real standouts here, what we're talking about um, in our panel, uh, really is the electrified vehicles, with battery electric vehicles coming to very low base, but up very, very strongly uh, by comparison to every other segment. And as I mentioned, are becoming a very, very important segment here already uh, in US and North America, but lagging uh, Europe perhaps, but still becoming very, very, very important. Um, some of the very, some of the research themes that, that we uh, look at uh, here at the Center for Automotive Research, because uh, around electric vehicles, uh, in, in general, they're having a profound impact and they're impacting every aspect of the, of the ecosystem for, uh, for automakers. We are about to publish some, some work, uh, uh, as, as, as Chris alluded to, as I mentioned, uh, around the impact on manufacturing for making this, this transition, but uh, having a significant impact. Some of the, we asked automakers around some of their greatest challenges in making this transformation and really and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, really around uncertainty of EV demand currently uh, and in, in being able to get some enough capacity in place. And they're ranking these over things, uh, uh, a, a greater challenge than even implementing new battery electric vehicles toward manufacturing processes, and also over uh, some of the skills, the upskilling and, and, and skill transformation uh, uh, that's required um, for, for manufacturing, but also impacting dealers. Some important things around that there's the opportunity to do build to order uh, and things, but yet uh, based on some of our research that this uh, uh, while an opportunity will kind of coexist along sort of traditional uh, 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 push sales that is more prevalent here in the US market, perhaps even more so in Europe, um, a, a, a tremendous new supply chain uh, with important visibility concerns, as is identified in some of the same research that we've done uh, by uh, at automakers, uh, and being able to have enough visibility up into uh, this new emerging supply base around uh, batteries, and electrified uh, uh, powertrains. Important implications for uh, this vertical integration that automakers are are adapting uh, to make. Uh, some of these uh, electrified powertrains themselves and being more up involved upstream, uh, even in some cases around raw materials, uh, going as far as raw materials sourcing. One of the one of the main concerns, again, that comes through in some of our research is uh, uh, really the risk and uh, uh, shortages around critical uh, mineral shortages. Uh, impacting even on the on end customers this uh, with EVs, is this digital experience and higher expectations that the consumers have that their EVs will work in many ways as well or in conjunction with their phones and things. Uh, um, increase still some lingering anxiety uh, with consumers here in the US, which in our, uh, in our opinion likely will mean that various uh, chemistries will, will coexist in the marketplace for some time, uh, uh, as well as some um, uh, various uh, 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 different powertrains as well. And then we see overwhelmingly that, that the government will play, continue to play an important role uh, in driving EV, uh, uh, the electrification of vehicles and incentives and, uh, and the ESG uh, kind of strategies by, by automakers. Uh, as I mentioned, really the overwhelming 
sort of uh, a challenge identified in our research that's uh, forthcoming in some uh, white papers and a report is really this divergence uh, Chris mentioned uh, with uh, expectations and forecasts for EV adoption here uh, in the U.S. and and even even globally. We've seen a, uh, an acceleration in, in EV plans by automakers uh, uh, and investment, and we've seen the the forecasts move up uh, very substantially over the last year two year. But but really a, a, a quite a delta, quite a range between uh, 25 to 50 percent. Uh, a mix, uh, the expectation by 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 2030, despite many public uh, targets announced by automakers of having, uh, you know, 50% in some cases better electric vehicle sales uh, uh, by that time frame. Uh, the other uh, thing here, I won't spend a lot of time, but just a, a real proliferation of models uh, and battery electric vehicles here in North America, from 60 around 60 today to over 280. Um, by by 20, launching between now and in in 2028, um, but still an important role uh, in this as we think about electric vehicles in North America. This might be different than than elsewhere around the world, where there'll be still an important contributions from um, uh, from hybrid uh, uh, vehicles as well out through uh, you know 2028, which further. Um, the automakers are having to account for and having uh, flexible production sort of plans uh, uh, and strategies uh, through throughout the rest of the, the decade here. Uh, a number of launches also complicating uh, things, a lot of announcements, but a lot of activity. Uh, uh, very early stages here in uh, in the US with, with launches, very uh, low volume with a significant amount coming in uh, 2024. 2025 and in the out years uh, as well. Uh, with that comes a significant amount of investment uh, that that uh, has been announced. We track this very closely at the Center for Automotive Research, and it's uh, you'll see uh, a, a clear standout here in 2021 with a majority of it uh, over close to 40 billion dollars in the U.S. with with other contributions in Canada and Mexico. Uh, with uh, all of the by all of the major automakers here, uh, it often in, in many cases at two billion dollars per per plant, uh, um, uh, uh, with additional investment for uh, co-located uh, battery assembly as well, uh, battery uh, cells, packs, modules uh, in close proximity. But but at this stage, equaling that um, at, uh, of that of the assembly. Uh, uh, CapEx as well. So just to give you some perspective for our audience, again, here for North America, Chris, those are really the end of my prepared slides and uh, love to get back to and, and really the Q&A here, please. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you, Edgar. That, that, that certainly describes the, the, the challenges that we, that we see, the changing landscape. And I think it cues us up perfectly to go into some detail with, with our panel now. And I actually kind of want to start on this point of, 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 of that, that pace of change, development, launch around EVs and batteries, um, how it's accelerating and, and what pressures that may put on manufacturing and supply chains. Um, so I want to kind of get bring the other pan, bring the other experts in by starting with their views on that. What do you see as the biggest impacts from this acceleration in, your, in the areas that you're particularly focused on? Dan, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you on that. Yeah. So just a reminder, our business is to design the equipment and the manufacturing systems that allow the OEMs to build their vehicles. So really positive thing for our industry as an automation supplier and a machine builder to see the number of launches. You're seeing uh, uh, the removal or the decline of engine assembly and you're seeing the emergence of battery assembly and uh, lots of interesting impacts onto a factory for that. The first is the legacy OEMs have to figure out how much is a brownfield strategy versus a greenfield strategy. I think initially you saw a lot of brownfield efforts and now you're seeing the commitments and the investment levels that Edgar mentioned are driving a lot of greenfield expansions and opportunities for us. And then even at the tooling level, you'll see that um, it's much easier to put together an EV car than it is an engine. An engine is a very unfriendly and difficult geometry to work with. There's tons of connections and, and failure modes. And so we're seeing a simplification of the manufacturing as well. So 
overall very positive. There's a lot of flux. I sympathize with the OEMs who have to maintain all of these different technologies and these different platforms and different assembly lines. And so people are really looking for flexibility. Sorry, I got a, absolutely, uh, Dan. I think you know it's 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 always a, a point that I I think of when uh, yeah, EVs in and of themselves may be a, a simpler tooling geometry, as you put it. But um, since most OEMs are, are probably producing that in addition to uh, a variety of other other powertrains, that's of course leading to to at least complexity and variation. Uh, certainly, as we as we go through this this next stage of it, uh, Ken, I'm interested to hear from your side. I guess particularly when you look across the the systems uh, landscape that, of course, is supporting supporting this. So just a reminder: you're on mute. So, um, what I'm seeing is, is it's really about time to value and speed and business agility. Uh, there is data everywhere. Uh, connected car data is largely untapped. Uh, there's great opportunity to take that information and go back and monetize that and, and really create new offerings for your customer, enhance the customer experience, improve the quality of your offering. Um, as well, on the back side of that is the supply chain. I think all the suppliers are getting demand forecasts. Just are they accurate? What is the volatility of that data? They're, they're reaching out to other industry sources to kind of validate what they're, um, what they're seeing and what, they're, what, what their actuals are and how to take that a step forward and actually drive that and, and have it improve accuracy, improve you know, inventory holds and, and stuff like that. So there's incredible opportunity. It's about the data. Absolutely. So we, we can see actually both, 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 both Dan and, and Ken certainly pointing to the positives and opportunities from this acceleration. Um, I think that it goes without saying that there are some risks, and, and I think Edgar alluded to, to some. We, the supply chain is, certainly seems to be one of them when we look across that. Um, maybe I can turn to you on that, Edgar. I mean, where do you see some of the risks? One of them you raised was that variation in forecast, I think, in terms of, of planning. Uh, are, are there other areas that the industry needs to look ahead to and, and look to mitigate? Uh, thanks, Tris. Uh, some of the, the greatest risk from our research is really upstream and is that around some of the critical minerals, uh, nickel and lithium. And there's a lot of activity uh, you know, by the automakers to, with an investment focus using joint ventures and, and investing upstream to make sure they can secure enough supply of these of these critical uh, minerals, so that is one of the chief risks that we've identified, uh, you know, thus far, um, you know, from our from our research, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that, that that's clearly a risk, and um, we've heard in other sessions just to put it in, in perspective, the uh, it's not only this it's the supply of those minerals as you mentioned, but at the moment, if we looked at some of the cost rises, lithium, cobalt, et cetera, we, we've seen something like a three or four fold uh, price increase in the, in the price of some of these batteries, which, of course, really disrupts and disturbs some of the business models that we've been seeing. Uh, Dan, would you add any other point from the risk where you see when you, you know, in the system and automation design and tooling, any other risks that you'd point to? Yeah, absolutely. So automotive companies for 100 years have largely been mechanical engineering organizations. And now we're seeing that maybe the mechanical engineering aspect of the car is, is taking a back seat there, no pun intended, to different types of engineering domains for which these companies don't necessarily have that talent. So you're seeing a greater importance now on certainly software development at the product design level, um, material science, if you are getting involved in the, the battery construction. And I think there's an enormous challenge, especially for a lot of the legacy OEMs here to figure out what is our new human capital organization look like? Where do we have an excess of maybe uh, mechanical engineers and a shortage of some of these, these new fields that are needed? And there's just uh, already an enormous shortage of engineers in the U.S. And now to compound that with such a fast shift that's happening, um, I think it's really interesting to take note on, on how the, the human resources side of the whole industry is going to need to change and, and morph real quick. And, and our company's up for that challenge. Will they be able to deliver on such a radical um, uh, human capital shift? major risk in my perspective. It's a great point and, and I mean, only compounded in the context of the so-called great reset, uh, sorry, great resignation and, and the sort of labor shortages that we see as endemic 
across the US, also in, in, in Europe. Um, a, a highlight to our audience in the next session, uh, this today we're, we're hearing from ZF's head of, of electrified powertrain on exactly that point, on how, how the company is trying to address that in the transition. And he, he, will talk very, he will talk very much in line with what Dan just said from the shift from mechanical engineering to software and, and systems, but um, but Ken, again, uh, uh, you know, software systems. This is right in <laughs> this is right in the heart of what of what you're doing. But where where what what are the risks do you see? The cost of compliance, I think, is is not well understood by the industry yet. Um, ESG. I know uh, GM had a town hall ten days ago where they're pushing down a pledge um, down to the suppliers to have them help fill out with the Ecovatus and the greenhouse emissions to help their score so they can achieve better uh, finance rates as tax credits. This this is a huge piece of complexity that uh, is just raising its head. It's, we're putting the borders around what the requirements truly are, but the, it's, it's going to be very complicated for folks. And um, it's an opportunity. Again, knowing your data, what, what are you capturing? The connected car is going to provide us more, more data than we can process. So, um, to me, it's it's really around um, building structures to make business decisions and leveraging ESG. Dan was spot on. Um, you know, the the Gen Zs want to work for a company that is doing the right thing from a you know human perspective, and that, that's going to if you don't follow this and you don't achieve these certifications, it's going to hurt your recruiting process, and you're not going to get the best people and the best engineers, which we're all fighting over, anyways. So a real need to align the vision, mission, purpose of, of, of the companies with skills and, and ambitions. I think that's also a great point. But the role that data will play. Uh, Edgar, I think you, you wanted to add something to that point. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Because I just wanted to emphasize some of the complexity in this transition because it, a lot of these traditional automakers are still reliant on the profits and uh, from these traditional uh, internal combustion engine uh, you know, products. And that, so we are entering this transitionary period where yes, it's accelerating and all these skills. I, 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 uh, I agree with Dan and, and Ken around, uh, be, there's a shortage in being able to get these skills in, in, in place and very quickly to support these very aggressive launch schedules. But at the same time, it's winding down and transitioning these, these traditional internal combustion engine plants. So we're entering this period where we're gonna have some capital in our view, capital inefficiency around um, perhaps even some redundant, you know, investment, you know, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and uh, um, it, it, there is complexity in this in this transition and still being able to harvest the, the profits, the existing sort of profits is very, very important in order to being able to invest in this EV future. It's a very interesting point, and one I did actually want to, to ask you relative to that, because it does seem to be, it goes without saying, this is an expensive transition when we look at the capital investments. I mean, if you, t if you take a, an example like like Ford's Blue, Blue Oval, I think 12 or $13 billion was the, was the figure for, for those kind of new facilities. I mean, these are investments on a scale that are most of us haven't haven't really seen in, in most of our careers and, and lifetimes. So, uh, when you look at, at that complexity, you know wh what's what are the key drivers of it? I mean, what's really driving those capital requirements? Is it is it the battery? Is it, is it the tooling? Is it a mix of everything? And maybe Edgar, if, if there's anything in your research that points to that, maybe that's a, a point to, to make. Well, uh, it, it, at the onset, the the numbers seem very very similar to us as far as the 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 large capital expenditure requirements between uh, a, a battery electric vehicle manufacturing plant and and traditional um, uh, ice plants. But we would expect there's some optimism that you will gain capital efficiencies and you will gain some efficiencies eventually as you make that transition over to electric vehicle uh, plants. But we're very early. I think some of it is the sure magnitude of bringing all of these, converting all of the existing Many, most of the ex existing North American manufacturing plants over to um, uh, over to EV. Um, it's the scale, the magnitude, and the speed at which is 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 in my in my view driving a lot of that sort of complexity. There are again opportunities we think to to improve and to get because there is uh, 
seem there's opportunities, there's less complexity, there's less build complexity, there's a number of opportunities here, but I think it's it's more structural. It's more the way it's happening, it's how hap how it's happening and how fast it's happening that is is uh, uh, driving some of that 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 the sheer dollar numbers, if you will. Yeah, and, and Dan, I mean, on your point, you you made the point earlier, which Edgar just said, which is that in many ways the you know some of the automation and tooling side of this is in fact you know an opportunity because it's simpler, um, but but uh, but nonetheless, it's still quite a lot to do it all at once, so to speak. So so w w where where do you see that the challenge there? Yeah, new new facilities are certainly expensive, and a lot of these public commitments, I'm not sure what's baked in there from a a research and design perspective and a product development perspective, but just to add maybe some some detail to the simplification that we're seeing, your average EV has about 40% fewer components than a uh, an ICE vehicle. And if you think about how a car goes together, you typically need a, a delivery mechanism, you need an install mechanism, you need a test mechanism for every single component that goes onto the car. So I do expect in five years to see a lot of the the tooling outfitting of a factory and a lot of the automation in initiatives actually become less costly for the auto OEMs, but they're in this tough spot right now of having to shoehorn it into a brownfield facility, create that space, move those processes. I can imagine there's a lot of um, maybe hidden factory expense, which is everything uh, that isn't something you can touch and, and put your hands on and, and use. But long term, I, I think it'll make building cars uh, much more egalitarian and, and easy for a lot of people to do. Thank you. And and Ken, I mean, one of the issues we we speak about with OEMs all the time is is the sort of legacy legacy systems that they're that they're managing and some of the challenges that that come that come with that is 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 that a, is that a, is that, a, is that an, also an issue within this or again, in fact, going to your earlier point, I mean, here's the chance to to go new and to and to maybe you know accelerate some of the transitions that from a data and system point of view that should have been happening before. Well, um, every everything's connected, right? So um, Amazon has spent a lot of money and time and research on what's the benefit of going to the cloud from a, a carbon perspective, and the, the numbers their research says is ten percent savings in um, in reduced greenhouse gases and carbon footprint. So that's a piece of it. Um, I think uh, you know the other thing is what are we what are we solving for? What are we tracking? So we're tracking the greenhouse gases in building the cars, and then what the cars are actually from an emissions perspective on the back end. So, you know, you've got to figure out how to connect those two as well as, you know, I've had a, a couple of customers reach out and say, what would be really great would be a compliance calculator. So we can figure out every time we change something, what's that do to our carbon footprint? What's that do to our financial operating model? So to try and integrate those two and, and formulize that in, in some way, shape or form. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. Maybe just a last point on the on the capital investment. And uh, Edgar, again, sorry to pick on you on this, but just getting a sense from your research, <clears throat> is this largely being sort of leveraged through through public traded companies and their and their and their shareholders through you know excessive leverage and debt? I mean, they're, they're, I'm sure it's a mix between. But but how are OEMs managing these huge investments, or how do you see them trying to manage these huge investments? Chris, they're they're using partnerships, alliances, uh, and working with others to help spread that that investment with uh, the battery manufacturers themselves, uh, and then also all the way upstream through uh, you know some of the minerals and mineral processing and extraction of lithium uh, and things like that because it is an expensive, it's a significant, enormous as we've discussed, uh, you know, transition here. So that's the primary mechanism. Uh, as of now, and then harvesting uh, the profits that they're generating from uh, from their conventional business now, and and, and reinvesting that uh, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And and also, um, you know, you you made the point, you showed the graph on the investment in North America. Um, we we probably would expect the U.S. to be out in front, given it's the larger market and the larger share of production. Although it would seem. If we looked back, I don't know, 10 years ago when there was a lot of capacity going into Mexico and a lot of shift to low, you know, as a lower cost base, it looks to me like the U.S. is an outsized uh, portion of this investment. And, and do you see do you see a kind of divergence, if you like, uh, in North America there in favor of the U.S.? Or will that perhaps correct itself in, in, in a kind of medium term, long term? 
I think that'll correct itself over the medium and long term. Uh, you know, Chris, it, yes, it, it was the pendulum had swung uh, in one in that direction. But I think you will see some uh, battery, you know, EV investment in Mexico and in, 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 in Canada. You're seeing some battery supply parks and things uh, happening in Canada uh, in support of, uh, of, you know, more EV assembly plants there. So I think it will correct itself some, but the U.S. will remain the dominant uh, uh, gain the dominant share because this is where the dominant share of the the EV market is and will is is expected to continue to be for uh, uh, throughout the next through you know for the foreseeable future really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, again, Dan, you've you've spoken a few times about the opportunities now and some of the simplifications. I just thought it would be interesting just to, to, amongst your customers where you're seeing some of the most. Uh, activities, investments in terms of sort of final assembly systems, automation, is it pointing in some new directions? Uh, it would be great to get a, a sense of that from you. Yeah, flexibility is now maybe more important than outright speed. You know, someone who's worked in automotive for a while, it was how do we go from 60 jobs per hour to 70 jobs per hour? And, and, and how does the equipment facilitate that? Now it's like, hey, we might have demand of up to, say, five jobs per hour for a new EV launch up to 15 and and what equipment that has an ROI today will also allow us to maybe um, meet some uncertain demand. So what does that look like? We're certainly seeing the use of AGVs, autonomous guided vehicles, also called autonomous mobile robots, AMRs, putting assemblies uh, up on top of, of AGVs that allow you to add stations or subtract stations on the assembly line as volumes ebb and flow. Uh, we're seeing a, a, a desire for less overhead structure, less monuments in the floor so that if you have 50,000 square feet or 100,000 square feet dedicated to a process, again, that can change or snake through a plant, especially in a brownfield facility where you may not have that, that perfect rectangle to, to set up your new production process. So flex, people are paying right now for the flexibility premium as they try to both shoehorn and forecast some, and something that is very difficult to forecast. So um, we're trying to tailor our robotics, our assembly tooling with, to have more flexibility in mind as opposed to 75 jobs per hour outright speed, put doors on the side of a truck over and over. Fascinating. And, and, and again, we've spoken a, a few times with the other, other in the industry over the past two days. And there's a, a focus increasingly on the value over volume and, and, and that means, and I think that speaks somewhat to your point there around uh, flexibility over speed here and obviously managing that variation. Uh, Ken, I mean, uh, perhaps building right off of that point, I, I can imagine that that sort of flexibility, modular approaches, if you like, uh, are undergirded by, by uh, data and, and, and connectivity. So, so are these the areas that you're really seeing more investment and focus in uh, amongst your customers? Um, yeah, obviously it's it's critical, and we I, I think we all know eighty percent of your supply chain data is outside your four walls, so it's really to help customers understand that and understand that you know uh, there was a huge breach a couple months ago because of a supplier had a loophole right and you know everything that touches your enterprise um, from your supply chain is is going to impact your business. So really understanding that and having the right controls in place, the right governance model and some way to um, work with your partners because everything's going to be partner related, uh, which because of the interconnectedness. Um, so that's um, the, the, it's a priority for us and, and for our customers. Excellent. And w w one thing as well, when we talk about the this this com this conversion, this uh, transformation, um, we're seeing in some different approaches, whether it's uh, factories being converted entirely uh, to EV already, whether it's a uh, factory zero for GM, Svikau and, and Emden for, for Volkswagen, um, whilst of course others others taking a more, more flexible approach and varying, varying that line. I'm sure things will shift in the longer term view, but I'll just get a, interested, Edgar, from your research, um, where you see it going in the next several phases, you're starting to see trends and pattern emerge in terms of that flexibility, a uh, multi multi powertrain approach, so to speak, or more consolidation around full EV plants. 
It's it's a mix of both, and I it, it's a nuanced answer, uh, Chris. I wish I had. Uh, I, I think we see clear opportunities for a dedicated battery electric vehicle assembly plant in some of the improvements in throughput, uh, more capital efficiencies. I mean, we see longer term uh, the opportunity, um, you know, with these plants. But in the near term, as we make this transition over, and again, as I, I said before, the importance of the conventional vehicles and and harvesting the profits from these these traditional internal combustion engines, uh, there's a bit more complexity around that transition and the way this footprint will evolve. We're not going to go straight to uh, uh, full battery electric vehicle de dedicated plants in all cases yet. So there will be this walk uh, uh, that happens here in the near term where there is there are some everybody's there are a lot of different approaches to this um, and how the how it will impact the manufacturing footprint. And, you know, some will run, will have, will require the, a lot of that flexibility that Dan had mentioned uh, in extreme cases where you've got um, uh, battery electric vehicles, hybrids and conventional internal combustion engine uh, vehicles running down essentially, you know, the same or similar lines. So um, it's, we see the opportunity to, uh, you know, with that, with, with pure battery electric vehicle facilities, but we're, we're going to have to walk there it's, and it's going to be a little bit of a, um, um, a little bit of a walk, if you will, and, and in some complexity in order to get there. Great. So um, I could go all day on most of these topics with you guys, but um, jumping, jumping to perhaps a bit more around, around the battery, um, which, which clearly is, is a <clears throat> huge part of this, this chain. Um, Dan, I wanted to sort of turn to you there in terms of where I believe you're focusing quite a bit on battery systems as well at, at Eckhart. Um, wh wh where are you seeing the new types of automation? Is it, for example, largely concentrated in the cell production process, more in the pack and enclosure side, mix of both? Again, I just look to kick that off with you. Yeah, so working with battery automators dream, right? You have small canisters that look like old camera rolls of film that then get organized into uh, matrices and arrays that are held together by straight pieces of, of metal tubing or waved pieces of tubing. And then those go in a rectangular enclosure. So this just really opens up a lot of very vanilla, straightforward, robotic pick and place um, and, and robotic material tending um, applications that you just don't really see elsewhere on on the the ice side of um, the industry there so um, you're seeing a lot more and if you look at the the videos that are available from the the Tesla Gigafactory it's highly automated and it's and it's moving and building up these different arrays of, of modules um, there's lots of automated testing that can then be done once you have it in a semi form finished form factor the skateboard and that testing was previously hard to do with an engine you had to hook it up to fuel potentially you had to do something about the exhaust there was a lot of additional connections that really made it difficult to test engines and um, unless you had a dyno at the end of the line but so we're seeing a simplification of both assembly simplification of testing uh, shipping as well you can stack batteries and get a, a dozen on a on a shipping container and they can pack nicely into a container as well. So there's a, a shipping premium and a logistics premium there too, that doesn't really get much airtime. So it's just a much friendlier thing to, to work with from the automator standpoint. It's, it's interesting that you, you point to it even, even, uh, even friendlier on the shipping side, because we, we've tended to think of the, the um, hazardous goods classification and the challenges that come with transport around that. But it sounds like in terms of actual nesting and packaging and, and where you can, can scale that, it is there's advantages so uh, thanks again great great insights there ken one of the things i've been picking up or we've been picking up with uh, discussions of battery cell producers and module assemblers is actually that the uh, noems the data management of this year is also super critical um <clears throat> whether it's kind of capturing cell quality data upstream and, and and accounting for that i'm just again wondering if you're seeing seeing uh this accelerate some of the points that you raised earlier around system architecture cloud etc so christopher um what i would say is predictive maintenance has really come to prime time for us um, we're working with many of our suppliers and helping them build um, off of the analytics and the ai some extensions with machine learning which as time goes on 
We get better numbers. We get tighter algorithms. We can predict defects. Um, it's huge for the quality process. It stops, uh, expedites. It's um, it's really something that's it's almost common now, right? So uh, that that's that's probably the biggest um, b- biggest movement I've seen. Okay, yeah, excellent. Um, we have about five six minutes left. Um, one point coming back again to perhaps related to the, the the human factor here, but more specific to to labor. Um, if we look at the North American picture, and Edgar, I'm I'm, I'm going to turn to to you on this. I know Carr is closely involved and does lots of research and work on on the labor side. It's notable that some of the investments are are from from the Detroit Three are, are not necessarily in the Midwest and and are in free three states or will likely be non unionized at least to start. Um, how do you see uh, labor negotiations uh, further influencing manufacturers' decisions on that? changes in the manufacturer and the production footprint? They'll, they'll be very, very important, uh, uh, Chris, as you, as you might expect, given the timing with, with a number of these, these uh, facilities coming online around the, uh, around the time of uh, the next uh, union contract negotiations, um, a number of new skills and things that are emerging. I mean, we are still very much on the early adoption curve around the rollouts of these, these plants. So there's, Yes, there's examples of some of the new um, skills and things that would be required at the assembly plant in the, in the manufacturing. I, I think that, in my personal opinion, is a bit more broader. I think it has to do more with the digital transformation of the manufacturing than it is. I mean, yes, there are important new uh, 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 job station, you know, with the you know differences around the battery install and 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 in differences in powertrain, but. Um, you know, there, we're still very early around some of these skills, and there's some. Uh, also, as we've got new partners, uh, new suppliers that are providing more of the value in the batteries. Uh, that uh, so it, it'll be very, very, it'll be very, it'll it's critical, really, and very, very important. And and uh, um, you know, the automakers are going to really have to work together with their unions in order to accomplish uh, this. It's all hands on deck, really. In, in, in my opinion, to, to make this transition and to get all these plants online in time. And um, there's just so many of these plants, you know, coming. So yeah, mm. vitally important, Chris. Mm. Mm. And, 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 and maybe one of our closing points, Ken made a great point earlier around the sustainability ESG targets, both in the context of the goals for employees, uh, even down to system selection, like using the cloud to reduce emissions. <clears throat> just, just keen to, to perhaps close a little bit around what, how important uh, or how, how the sustainability targets will further impact some of these decisions that OEMs making, be it on the location or on the equipment stuff that they're using. Dan, maybe I can turn to you on that in terms of, do you see that even at the kind of automation system design level uh, playing a key role? Not yet, not yet. I know that a lot of the recent plant relocation decisions are also have been based on the availability of electricity and where that electricity comes from. So certainly Chattanooga did a ton to, to court and woo everything that Volkswagen had going on in that area. And, and the uh, the electrical infrastructure was a big part of that there. But I don't really see the uh, sustainability element yet at the, mm-hmm. the factory floor level where, where I'm working day to day. Yeah, well, f- fair enough. And, and, and that's interesting in of itself. Uh, Ken, and anything further you'd add there? You made the point earlier, of course. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, with the ESG requirements, so so Dan's right. It, it's it's not standard production today, but it, we're we're going that way. And I'm my goal is to look out and and be in front of this, right? So the ability for these factories like Volkswagen and Chattanooga to they're going to in effect be operating their own grid. So the ability to move power in and out from different lines, from water to air to solar to whatever. Um, and to be able to manage that and then be able to track that and be able to prove that for a certification perspective. Um, that That's business flexibility that's that, that people need to plan for. Excellent. Edgar, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think it's been very important from an investment, the upfront investment, you know, decisions, uh, especially as this, this emerging battery supply chain um, uh, unrolls here in in North America. There's a you see ESG uh, uh, is an important 
investment consideration decision factor in those. Uh, uh, the supply pay, you know, uh, Ken had mentioned, you know, the uh, some of the suppliers and and uh, you know their role, and th there still needs to be a lot more communication back, you know, with the suppliers uh, about what their expectations are. So these things are coming to to, to Ken's point, uh, are coming fast. Um, there still aren't a lot of there needs to be more um, sort of common metrics and things that how uh, suppliers would be held accountable in these things, but it is having a, a significant impact on how this uh, uh, supply base, this really new emerging supply base here in the U.S. for batteries uh, uh, is evolving. And it, it, we hear it time and time again. We hear it uh, uh, ranking up. There's one of the top considerations for uh, where they're putting some of these uh uh, you know, the supply base around these uh, uh, assembly plants and the ecosystem that's forming. So, yeah, it's coming hard. And, uh, it, 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 it's real. It, it is real indeed. And I think to, to your point, it's certainly in the upfront decisions now that we see on, on location, on facilities and connecting that, playing a big role. I would expect, as, 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 as Ken alluded to, and I think, you know, for Dan, that it's coming down the line as well. Uh, no pun intended, but um, <clears throat> or maybe a little pun, pun intended. Um, uh, gentlemen, this this has really been a, a, a great sweep through what's uh, some of the key points when we're considering converting ICE to EV. What are, what the landscape, how it's changing. Uh, I really thank you for for the time you you shared with us and our audience and answering my questions. Um, there's a lot more that uh, we're looking forward to discuss with you. Uh, as the as this unfolds, um, and we hope to capture that on on AMS. So, a big thanks again to everyone for their time, and and to our audience. And to the point I made earlier, just in a few minutes, uh, in, in about um, just as the hour turns, we will be going to a, a fireside chat with uh, Arno Gullering, the senior vice president of powertrain operations, electrified powertrain operations at ZF, and talking more about this transformation from ICE to EV and what that means for people, processes, systems. So you won't want to miss that. It's a great follow-on to what we just had. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and we'll, we'll be back real soon.